Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. We'll have you take your seats. I know you all are happy to see one another. I'm happy to see you. You all look fabulous. <laughs> fabulous, fabulous. Welcome to the National Museum of African American History and Culture. My name is Doretha Williams. I serve as the director for the Center for the Digitization and Curation of African American History, uh, generously funded by Mr. Robert F. Smith. The Center is determined to preserve local histories through our major components, one being our community curation program where we're out and about in the communities helping families and institutions to preserve their history. We also manage an internship and fellowship program where we hope to diversify the field and nurture new and excited minds about the museum field. We also offer our Great Migration Home Movie Project, where soon and very soon, in the next few weeks, we will relaunch, where visitors are allowed to bring in their VHS tapes and other media types to have them digitized on site and while they're at the museum. And of course, as many of you know, we host and manage the Family History Center, which is a physical space and a virtual space. We're physically located on the second floor, and you can also join us virtually for programs like this, as well as genealogy sessions. Today, we welcome you for a presentation by Bernice Alexander Bennett about her book, Black Homesteaders in the South. I will now bring to you Lisa Crawley, who was one of our genealogy reference assistants in the Family History Center. Please note that there will be a question and answer period after this program, as well as a book signing outside of the theater. Uh, now hear from Lisa Crawley. Thank you, Doretha. It is my honor this afternoon to introduce our guest speaker, Ms. Bernice Alexander Bennett is a nationally known genealogist, award-winning author, and host of research at the National Archives and Beyond Blog Talk radio program. Her research interests focus on Southeast Louisiana and Edgefield and Greenwood counties, South Carolina. The New Orleans native has published and contributed to two award-winning genealogy books, including Our Ancestors, Our Stories, and Tracing Their Steps, a memoir. In 2019, Bennett received the Elizabeth Clark Lewis Award for Original Research from the Afro-American Historical and Genealogical Society. Bennett currently serves on the Board of Directors for the National Genealogy Society and is a volunteer with the Homestead National Historical Park Service. Will you please join me in welcoming Bernice Alexander Bennett. Hello, everyone, and I am just so happy to see you. Yes, it may be cold outside, but it's warm in here. Warm because your heart is warm, and my heart is full. Uh, it is with great humility that I stand before you to talk about the untold stories of black homesteaders. Yes, the untold stories. And to say that the descendants that researched and contributed to the Black Homesteaders of the South book will change the narrative and have everyone checking to see if their ancestors owned land under the Homestead Act of 1862. I'd like to thank Lisa Crawley for hosting and inviting me to speak today. It is just wonderful to know that we're here at the museum to talk about genealogy, history, and yes, our black history. And so to get started, I'm going to share with you all a quick video. Thank you. 
I'm park guide Jessica Corgi, and welcome to Cultivating Connections at Homestead National Historical Park. For today's program, we aim to cultivate connections to that question of who am I? It's an existential question, it's a genealogical question, it's a cultural question, and it's a question that sometimes can feel impossible to answer. But today, we're gonna offer a starting point, a resource, a free resource that you can look at today to see if perhaps your family story includes the Homestead Act. Today, we'll also hear from descendants of black homesteaders and their grassroots efforts to learn and share their family homesteading stories on the National Park Service website. And you can learn to become part of this grassroots effort as well. Black homesteading in America is a big story. It's exciting because as families and individuals discover how to research homestead records, uh, more and more people are finding pieces to that question of who am I? Black homesteaders were there in all 30 homesteading states and claimed homestead land for over a century. There is a huge narrative to be told. Of course, race was omitted on homestead forms, which uh, adds a little extra dose of difficult for the researchers out there. But if you are a family member of a homesteader and you figure it out by using the tools given to you today, you can work towards placing your family story onto the National Park Service as well. At this time, I'd like to give thanks and appreciation to Bernice Bennett, who is an author and a genealogist, and she has been a force in this grassroots movement. She may have been the one that lit the flame. <laughs> Bernice, your efforts in sharing the stories of our Southern homesteaders, as well as encouraging and um, being a mentor to people across the nation seeking those answers as well. Just thank you, Bernice. I know you're only one person, but you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And I want to thank Jessica, because Jessica is with the National Park Service in Nebraska, and Jessica reached out to me because she knew that I was a descendant of a homesteader. And she said, well, can you help? We want stories. What can you do? And that's where it all started, and that's where we are today. So if you look at this poster and you see the word free land, millions of acres, and then you see the word, the American dream. Well, what does that mean to you? What do you think it meant to our ancestors in the 19th century? Clearly, education was one of those ba basic rights we felt was essential when you talk about freedom. Also, the right to vote. Now, I have this education picture up here. Actually, my grandmother is in this picture in 1901. And then land, land ownership. And this is a picture of one of the descendants of a homesteader, Silas Emanuel Jones, the grandson of Silas Jones. And he's visiting the family homestead last January. So this photo is courtesy of Deborah Mitchell. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you. <laughs> so one of my genie friends, a documentarian, historian, and genealogist, Leonard Smith III, wrote, as black Americans research and follow their ancestors' paper trails, they further verify that they were resilient 
and resourceful people against all odds. Documenting land ownership under the Homestead Act of 1862 is an excellent piece of family history. It's not just the valuable genealogical and community information it may contain, it can also show the trials and tribulations involved in obtaining and keeping the land. And I think some of you can shake your head and say, yes, you understand what that means. And so I will go over several things with you today. I'll go over the Homestead Act, of which Jessica said this was a big act, and it was very important for us to understand what this meant. I will talk about the eligibility requirements, the application process, what you can learn from the land entry papers, what is a land patent, and then I'll give you little vignettes, uh, untold stories. So today I want to tell you, this is my grandmother. Today is her 129th heavenly birthday, February 4th. And my grandmother told me that her granddaddy owned a lot of land. This is what got me started, folks. Many people may have heard this from their family. They may have had oral history or a document, but she actually told me this, and she lived to be almost 106 years old. And this is the land patent. This is the proof that's available to us right now because my cousin has it, and she gave me a copy of the land patent. So let me go back and talk about the Homestead Act of 1862. Now, I posted a question on Facebook, and I said, did any of your ancestors own land under the Homestead Act of 1862? And the responses that came back was, no, we were enslaved. We didn't have any land. What are you talking about? Of course not. We didn't have any land. Well, the Homestead Act, just to understand what it is, it made thousands of acres available for settlement from land that the U.S. government acquired, understand where this land came from, from indigenous nations through war, treaty negotiations, and allotment. The Homestead Act allowed African Americans, whites, and immigrants who were eligible for citizenship to acquire up to 160 acres of land, and they had to pay a nominal filing fee. So keep that number, 160 acres. That's what we're looking for. So what you see here is that this act was signed by Abraham Lincoln on May 20th, 1862. And it went into effect January 1st, 1863. In fact, the first homesteader homesteaded in Beatrice, Nebraska, and his name was Daniel Freeman. Individuals applying for this land had to be over the age of 21. They could never take up arms against the U.S. Single women, widows, immigrants, and later former slaves could also apply for this land. Now, there was an application process. They had to settle on the land. Then they had to file an application and then pay a small fee. They had to cultivate, improve, and live on the land for a minimum of five years. They had to bring witnesses. And this is the part that's so exciting. They had to bring witnesses to testify that they did what they were supposed to do with this land. Then they had to uh, post this information in the newspaper and then file for a deed of title and pay another fee. So just think about this process. However, what was going on during that period? Civil War, that's right, the Civil War. But after the Civil War, there was another act, and it was called the Southern Homestead Act. And that act went into effect June 21st, 1866. And it opened up about 46 million acres of land. And individuals could apply and get up to 80 acres. Now this land 
was they thought that this, this is the land that will go to whites, poor whites maybe, individuals that are part of the United uh, States colored troops. But what else was going on during this time? The war was over, and what happened to people? Well, many signed labor contracts. So they weren't applying for a land. They couldn't because they'd already signed these, these labor contracts. You understand that? These Freedmen Bureau labor contracts. Also, I want you to understand, the states that they designated for the Southern Homestead uh, Act were Louisiana, Mississippi, Arkansas, Florida, and Alabama. All Southern states, all former Confederate states. This act was poorly administered, unfortunately. They didn't have the land offices set up to take the applications. And in fact, in some parts, people didn't even know it was available. And it was repealed in 1876. However, during this whole period of time, we had three Reconstruction Acts. We had the 13th Amendment, we had the 14th Amendment, and we had the 15th Amendment, which meant that individuals were now, yes, you were citizens. There's no doubt you are a US citizen, which means that you could apply for this land. So look at the public land states today. Every state that's on this map that's in brown, this is where you will find individuals eligible to get homestead land. And as Jessica mentioned, we have black homesteaders in all of these states. What we need to do is to find them. We need to find the people. Any of the states that are in blue, these were not public land states. So I have often been asked, well, what about Texas? Well, what about Massachusetts? Well, what about this? Understand, those in blue, they were not public land states. Those in brown, so you have 30 states of which we could find black homesteaders. Now, I mentioned to you that this act went into effect and it was poorly administered. Well, I found this newspaper article, uh, the Troy Messenger newspaper, and there was an article in there, actually a letter, and it was really asking, where are the people, where are the officials, who's gonna administer this? And a statement came out of the newspaper saying, the fact that Negroes are allowed to secure homesteads under the laws is one fact which ought to be public. I love it. It ought to be public. And some pains taken to communicate it to them as they are not readers generally. Then the other new features that are public land are subject to the homestead law is not known. So what, what did we have going on here? We probably had a big old grapevine saying, wait a minute, this is some public land, this is land we can get. If Mr. Charlie gonna get land, I'm gonna get land too, right? <laughs> and so let's, let's hope that this is what happened because yes, the word did spread. In fact, in the Black Homesteaders of the South book, we have 49 stories from five states, 49. Now you know we have more stories than that. There are a lot more stories. And I am hoping today, those that are listening live stream, and even you will go and find your land. Because the goal here is to tell your story. You need to get that stuff out of the archives and put it in writing and create your history, because this is your black history. So the Black Homesteaders Project is the project that really was the catalyst to get me involved to try to get you involved to tell your stories. Now stories are on the website right now. And those stories are stories, it started off with the Center for Great Plains. Many African Americans 
had homestead colonies in Nebraska and other places, but they were west. But when the word got out that we were looking for stories, guess what, folks? We started finding stories everywhere. In fact, the largest number of stories that we have in the book are from Louisiana and Mississippi. How about that? <laughs> So this is just one image on the website, and what I will do as I talk about the Homestead Act and the stories, I will toggle back. I will show you a few stories that are in the book and also stories that are on the website. Because the goal right now is for you to tell your story, submit it to the National Park Service so that you could become a part of that history. And it's wonderful. You go on the site right now and you see black homesteader stories. So let me just kind of tell you who they are. Now the black homesteaders, and I'm gonna repeat this a lot, but the black homesteaders are individuals that applied for and received the land patent for up to 160 acres of land under the act. All were over the age of 21. All, we, we even have seen individuals 60 and 69 applying for that land. I'm like, that's right, you don't have to wait. If you know that land is available, apply for it. There were men, single women, and widows that applied. Some were free people of color, some were formerly enslaved, some were former members of the United States Colored Troops and all of them are identified as you read those stories. You will know who was in a, the U.S. color troops. You will know who was formerly enslaved because it is in the narrative. So what did it take? And this is really the hard part. It took money. Now, somebody asked me, well, where do you think they got the money from? I said, people worked, they, they, they had money, they even had a penny jar, but they knew they wanted land and they did what they had to do. But they needed money because they had to split, pay a small filing fee. They also needed farm tools and seeds and livestock. They needed skills. Now, I can tell you right now, nobody had to teach them about agriculture, right? <laughs> they, knew, they knew how to tend that land. Animal husbandry, carpentry, blacksmith, and many, many more skills. They also needed community support. When you start reading and you start looking at the record, what do you see? You see witnesses. You see people that are family members, friends, and they are there helping each other. You saw white witnesses supporting black witnesses, and you saw cousins and every, you name it, we saw it. So I mentioned the word land patents. Now, a land patent is the transfer, it's a legal document, and it transferred land ownership from the United States government to individuals. That's the goal. We're trying to get that land from the government so that we could then own that land. But how do you even know you have a homesteader in your family? Well, you might know because you visited the family farm. You just didn't know it was a homestead farm. Or somebody told you, as my grandmother said to me, that her granddaddy owned a lot of land. But let's look at a website that can help you really quickly. This is the Bureau of Land Management website. And if you know where your ancestors live and you know the name, I, I want to tell you, it's really just that simple. You put the name on the website, and my ancestor is Peter Clark from Louisiana. I put his name in there, and look what happened. His name popped up. Peter Clark, he received his land in 1896. It was in Louisiana, Livingston Parish, and they gave me the township and everything. Just that quick, just that easy. And so other information also came up. I mentioned Louisiana, 1896, here is his name. 
But I also see he went to the New Orleans land office. You'll get that kind of detail just on this form. We know it's the Homestead Act because what does it say? May 20th, 1862. So that was the, the, that's where he got it from. And then we have his application number, and then we have his patent number, and we have the number of acres, 159.33 acres of land. This man went from enslavement to land ownership. He was born in 1855. And this is my great, great grandfather. So I mentioned a land pattern. Now the pattern image will come up on the Bureau of Land Management website. You'll see this image. And the image will have the name, the location of the land, the amount of acres, the president, whoever signed the uh, patent, and the date. So I know this. Now how many of you have seen a document that looks like this? Anybody? Okay, so when you, when you saw this document, did you think you had everything you needed? Yep, some people are saying, well guess what folks, if you find a document like that, that's the end of the process. In, think in, I found this document, that means there's something else. And that's called a land entry case file. Now I want to right now thank someone who was instrumental in helping us. And that's Mr. Dennis Evelyn from the National Archives. Thank you, Dennis. Dennis believed in us. He believed in what the homestead descendants wanted and he helped us get those case files because those case files are at the National Archives. Now can you man imagine thousands of boxes of your ancestors' stories sitting in a box at the National Archives because you have not requested your case files? Can you imagine? I think this is your file, Angela. <laughs> Right there, Arkansas. But you know, when you open up this box, and when I open up the box with my own ancestors' papers, I, I tell you, I had this, this chill. I felt like my grandmother, my great-grandmother, Peter Clark were all standing behind me saying, get this box open. <laughs> it's about time you found my story. It's about time, because it's not just the patent. I want you to know what I went through to get that land. So here's Luann Wills, Merrill. And I told Luann, I have a surprise for you. You're going to see something. Behind Luann is the land patent. Now this, this image, this patent has been in her family. But after researching her family's story for 50 years, she was introduced to the land records. Verda Wills is her ancestor. And he lived, as she wrote, to see a dream come true. I, I love that. You know, I showed you the slide with the dream. He lived to see a dream come true, right? He became the owner of 39.93 acres of land around the historic town of Canago in Choctaw County, Mississippi. In one generation, Vordell successfully led his family from slavery to freedom, establishing a 120-acre farm and a new way of life for future generations of the Wills family. Now, I just said, I got to say, all right. You know, every time I would get a story. I would celebrate for that person. You could not see a story come into my email without me congratulating them because that's what we need to do, support each other. So let's talk about what you can find in the files. 
you're going to find, of course, the settler's name, where he or she was born, the settler's age. Yes, you will find out how old this person was. That's why I could tell you, you had those individuals that are in their 60s, and they got that land. You're going to find out when they settled on the land, and settling on the land and applying for the land are two different dates. You're going to find out exactly where that land is located, and you're going to find out how much the filing fee was and when they paid it. Then you're going to find out what improvements were documented in the file. I love this part because then you're going to find out about the corn crib and the log house and how many bedrooms. Yes, that's the kind of details you will find in those land entry case files. You're also going to find out whether the person signed with an X or whether they had their signature. Could they read or could they write? Also, you'll find out how many people lived in the household. You might not find their names. However, this is what genealogy is all about, right? You're going to find a home, and he had 13 children, a wife and 13 children. You're going to find all those children, because that's what your genealogy means. You're going to go look for them. You're going to find the names of the witnesses. And let me tell you about those witnesses. Some of those witnesses you will find may be former slave owners. Some of those witnesses could be brothers and sisters. Some of those witnesses were also black homesteaders. But this is what you find when you go through this document. You start seeing stuff and saying, wait a minute. I need, to, I need to research and find out who those people are. Don't let that name sit on your file or sit on your computer. You're going to find out who they are so you can tell a richer, stronger, better story. You're going to find out when they um, obtained the patent and the patent number, and there may be even more details. So let me just give you some little vignettes. Let's start with Alabama. Do you know there were about 4.5 million acres of land out of the state's total land area of 33.5 million acres? Homestead were available to Americans in Alabama. Now, that's a lot of land. But in the end, in the end, 41,819 homestead applications were filed and approved. Now, you had some that abandoned it. They didn't go through the full process. Now, the stories that we have in this book, five out of six homesteaders in the book lived in counties in the southeastern corner of Alabama. So here's one Alabama family. John Cowles. And the descendant is Dr. Mary Clark. Now, Dr. Mary Clark has taken this to a whole new place, folks. Seriously. I went to the National Archives yesterday, and she had so many boxes of land entry case files. I don't know if she even finished copying them all. But it has just opened up so much information for her. So her ancestor was in Coffee Springs, Geneva County, Alabama. Anybody here from Coffee Springs or Coffee County? Ah, yes, hi. <laughs> well, she found information about her ancestor and he received his patent the 21st of November in 1894. So she also found, well, there are five ancestors and 21 witnesses, and some of the children of the witnesses married the family members. So I'm continuing to discuss, discover surnames that are related by my man. I mean, this is a, a message. We're talking back and forth to each other, but I could relate to what she was saying. This is a story that needed to be told. And she had the picture of John Henry and Francis Fanny Edding Cowles. And so this was one of those stories that I say, congratulations, Dr. Mary, you got your story in. But she's now on a roll. I, I expect Dr. Mary this time next year will have a Black Homestead as an Alabama book. <laughs> Hint. <laughs> 
Now, I mentioned to you that some of the stories are also put online. So I'm going to toggle back and forth what's in the book, what's online, and some are both. So Vandy Hutchison is an ancestor of Orrice Jenkins. He is actually the great-great-grandson of Vandy Hutchison and Betty Horns. And this is what his story looked like on the National Park Service website. He's also saying, my ancestor was born enslaved in uh, Coffee County, Alabama. So now we have two individuals with Coffee County, and I'm telling you, there's more to come from both of them. But this is what the application looked like. Now, there's questions that people are asked. So there's a question that said, describe your house on the claim and given the value. And he said, one log dwelling. I don't know what else he was saying, but one log dwelling value at $10. Then, well, what farm implements do you own? He went on to say, one plows, one hose, two axes, and I don't know, I don't remember how long I have owned them, but it's in, the, <laughs> you know, he's telling you. Then they went on to ask him about animals, domestic animals. Well, look like he said, I don't have any horses, I don't have any cattle, I don't have any hogs, don't have any sheep. Well, then it went on, tell us about your furniture. I mean, can you imagine reading something a hundred years ago and they're telling you about the furniture and the animals. Oh, it gets, it gets really good in some of these files. But these are two Alabama homesteaders that I think we're going to find a whole lot more coming out of them. Right, Mary? Where are you, Dr. Mary? There she is. And Oris, yes. Because they are into that. They are committed. See, the ancestors won't leave them alone. They won't, and that's what happens. When you open up those files, that stuff is there. It's in your face, and you can't just walk away. Now that you've, op you've opened it up, and that's what it's all about when you're looking for that land. And these are the descendants that contributed to the Black Homesteader book. Lyle Gibson, of course, Dr. Mary, Orish Jenkins, Charles Wilson, and Marcia Green Lamar. So let's go to Arkansas. <laughs> well, Arkansas had 74,600 homesteaders. Those are the numbers that were approved. Now, you know we need to find a whole lot of Arkansas homesteaders, don't we? We were in there. They had a total, you know, when you look at the acreage, 33 million plus acres of land, and that represented 24% of the land in the state of Arkansas. And we have stories from Bradley, Sevier, and Dexter counties in Arkansas. Well, this was one of those files. This is a file that it would just make you go, what? In this file, this is Irving M. Bass. So would you believe that as they began to question him, there was a question in his file. For what period of periods have you been absent from your homestead since making settlement? He said, I was off the place for the purpose of going to school at three different times staying away not longer than six months at a time. And guess where he was, folks? He was at the Branch Normal College of the Arkansas Industrial University. And his descendant, she calls him Uncle Irvin, Angela Walton Raji, <laughs> found Irvin Bass right here as where they listed the students. Now, this was in his file. We found this information. In fact, I was talking to Angela on the phone. I said, Angela, look at this. He was in school. She went, what, what? <laughs> and she found it. And see, these are the little gems that you pick up when you're going through these land entry case files. 
So remember, I'm going to keep this going. The pattern is the end of the process. Where do you have to go? Where do you have to go? Case files, that's right. So now we're back on the National Park Service website. And this is a descendant of, at least Lyle Gibson is a descendant of Reuben Murphy. And this is what his story looked like. Again, when you put your stories out there, your stories become a part of a bigger picture. You go to the National Homestead Historical Park and you want to find an Arkansas homesteader, an Arkansas black homesteader, you'll see Reuben Murphy. You'll see Irving Bass and other Arkansas stories. And these are the descendants that wrote Arkansas stories. Angela Walt Raji, Susan Lastly, Jessica Trotter, and Lyle Gibson. So let's go to Florida, folks. Who's here from Florida? Ah! <laughs> so Florida had 28,096 homesteaders. That's how many proved up. And they had over 3 million plus acreage. And 10% of the land in the state was settled. So I want to share this. I love grandmother pictures. I just love grandmother pictures. And this is Mrs. Maud Humphreys. And this photo is courtesy of her granddaughter, Fallon. <laughs> and she is pictured, she is pictured holding a jar of red soil clay from her great great uncle Simon Sim Bell's homestead in Chattahoochee, Gaston County, Florida. And the jar is also sealed with a bell to represent her bell ancestors. Well, guess what he put in his file? There was a question. Are you a native-born citizen of the United States? If not, have you declared your intention to become a citizen and have you obtained certification of naturalization? And guess what he said? I am a native-born citizen of the United States by virtue of the Emancipation Proclamation of President Lincoln. All right. <laughs> now, now, I'm going to go real quick, because I'm told that I am almost out of time. So I'm flying through this right now. But I want to tell you that Fallon and another Florida homesteader descendant Margot Lee Williams have found several hundreds of black homesteaders. The stories are untold, but they have done the research and they know that there are more, which is something that everyone can do. And Margot has a, a, a blog called Personal Prologue, Family Roots and Personal Branches. And these are the Florida descendants. So let me just go real quick to Louisiana, because I have a lot. Louisiana has the largest number of stories, folks. And this is a story, and I just have to give you this information. What happened? This is Thomas Pittman. And his application uh, was in Washington Parish. Now, let me tell you what's in his file. Thomas Pittman canceled his application. It was called through a relinquishment file in the New Orleans General Land Office. But October 9th of that same year, he decided, wait a minute, I want my document reinstated. I want it reinstated. And they said, well, tell us more, that he is a colored man and alleges that acting on the advice of friends, he relinquished the entry for the reason of threats of contest for certain white citizens. This is in his file, folks. He is willing to risk proof 
of his original entry. His, state, his, his statement was corroborated by someone else. Bottom line, his entry was reinstated. He got his land. He didn't let them bully him into giving up his land. This is just something that you probably don't know, but every entry will have a newspaper clipping. Well, this is a newspaper clipping for Josiah Cyprian. And as I looked at that newspaper clipping, I saw the register was named Walter L. Cohen. Now, for those of you from New Orleans, we know who Walter L. Cohen is. But Walter L. Cohen was an African-American Republican politician and a businessman in the state of Louisiana. He was appointed to the position of register of the U.S. Land Office by President Theodore Roosevelt. And I wonder, did we have any black registers in those land offices when those black potential homesteaders walked in there with their papers? And here's one of them. I'm going to move quicker, but this is uh, another story that's on the National Park Service, but it's in the book. This story goes on and on, but I want you to understand that when George Pacinger passed away, there was something in the newspaper that said, Uncle George Pacinger died near Roberta on the ninth age 80 years old, 86 years old. Uncle George was born in Houston County, Georgia, and was brought to Louisiana as the property of Hamilton and Hodges by Gideon Allen during 1845. As a slave, he was humble and industrious. As a freed man, intelligent and upright. Well, there's a site called historygeo.com. And I wanted to see, well, just where was this land? And what I discovered was Hamilton was all over this land. He was next door to George P. A. Singer. And this is another site when you find your land, you can go to History Geo. I'm gonna go just much quicker. We talked about women. Here's a woman named Phoebe Ann Bartlett Franklin. She was born enslaved in 1835 on the Waterloo Plantation. Now this is Ascension Parish. And Kimberly Horn, the maternal, this is her maternal great-great-granddaughter, wrote the story and shared information about Phoebe. And she indicated a formerly enslaved woman did not allow anything to hinder her from pursuing the opportunity that could benefit her and her offspring for years to come. She got her land. Well, there's another story. You know, all these stories are not as what, what I would call, you may find some that really had problems. And this is one of them, written by Dr. Uh, Dolores Mercedes Franklin. There's so much information in that story. And she talked about what it meant for the land that they were on to be contested. And so you'll find that also. And here's information on History Geo about Frank Thompson. And these are the Louisiana uh, descendants. And my last story is Mississippi. I can't do it without saying something about Mississippi. <laughs> okay, folks, just take a look at this picture. Okay, what, what, what do you all see here? Calvin Caston, yes, Calvin Caston. He's right here, and he was the homesteader. And he's standing next to Richard Broomfield, Calvin Caster, Lydia Broomfield Caston, and Eli Broomfield. And guess who's seated? Who's seated? <laughs> OK, so this is a picture that was given to Dr. Nona Edwards Thomas, because Calvin Caston is part of her family, the Broomfield family. 
And so while I won't go into detail, I just want you to know, when you see this story online, know that it has been well researched, okay? And this is just the newspaper clipping of Calvin Caston. And then Norma B. Hall, look at these beautiful pictures. Now we talked about witnesses. Well, this is James Riley, and his witness was his brother, Van Riley. Yes. And so you will start seeing this, and this is in Amy County, Mississippi. By the way, the other story was in Pike County, Mississippi. And these are the Mississippi homesteaders. So I want to end this by saying, please share your stories. Follow those steps. But share your stories, because that's why we have the National Park Service, to share the stories of the black homesteaders. Also, I've created the Descendants of African American Homesteaders Facebook group. Join this group. Ask questions. You have descendants that can answer your questions. And I'm always putting something up there. How to order your file. Do you know what the, your land patent? Have you found your land patent? This is what we're doing. And I just want to end by saying, follow the footsteps of your land-owning ancestors. They did some amazing, amazing work. And we absolutely must honor them every day. Thank you so much. And I want to invite some of the descendants to come up on the stage, Fallon Goff, Oris Jenkins, Dr. Nona <laughs> Thomas, Mercedes, do I have everybody? Okay, and we are now ready to answer your questions. <laughs> Angela Walton Raji is up here. No, you, well, <laughs> you know, you need to be here for the mic. Okay, do I have any questions? Okay, so. Yes. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Jamie. Um, if I end up finding um, land that was homesteaded to an ancestor, um, how do, how do, can anyone share their experiences of how the, and I don't know how you know big the land plot is going to be, but how do you divvy that up between the descendants and can anyone share their experience? So you're saying if a, if an ancestor has passed away, but the land is still in the family, how do they determine who's going to get what? That's a family decision. They have to talk about it. Now, I have spoken to a descendant. Um, he's in Harrisburg, Mississippi. And his ancestor gave each child so many acres of land. He, they equally distributed the land. And what he explained to me is the, because he did it equally, there was no fighting about the land at all. And so, and again, it's, it's a family decision. It's what they decide how they want to uh, split up that land, the heirs. Okay, and if um, the um, original owner validly sold it, then it's no longer considered part of the descendants. That's correct. Okay. But understand, sometimes they lost the land. You may find documents where they lost the land, because of tax reasons, or it's a whole bunch of reasons that that land is not still in the family. But this is the part that I say to everyone, you wanna find the land, and then you wanna find out what happened to the land if the land is no longer in your family. 
Any of you want to say something? Thank you. I want to mention also, my name is Dr. Nona Edwards Thomas. I want to mention also some of my family members, cousins are still living on the land. about that um, previous question, check the newspapers too. You might find some chancery court cases about people you know, trying to figure out where the land is gonna go and also the tax liens are in the newspapers. So you might find more information there. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good Quick afternoon. question for you. I, first of all, let me say it's fantastic that you all have been able to find out so, many, so much information about your families and that's, that's great. My question really has to do a little bit with history as well. Most of the land that we're talking about, is this actually the land that was, um, that's part of the Trail of Tears that was forced, where Indians were forcibly removed in those states? No, this isn't that land. I mean, some of this land was definitely indigenous land, but we're talking about the land, yes, out west, a lot of that Montana, Nebraska, all of that land on that side. Okay, yes. I'm specifically talking about Alabama and and those areas. And those, are, those are some areas too, yes, that some of that land could have been from there. But remember, those lands were then part of, when they became the Confederacy, and those old slave owners, they owned a lot of that land. But that's why you have the Freedmen Bureau of Refugees and Abandoned Land, because then we had a lot of abandoned land too that made it possible for it to be a part of the Homestead, the Southern Homestead Act of 1866. Hi, thank you for your presentation. I have a quick question. Uh, so just wanna know like how, now that you have your paperwork and you discover this is your land, what do you do with it at that point? And legally, do you have like legal reference, representation, someone helping you through the process? Hi, my name is Norma Hall. Uh, with my family, we have two things going on. Uh, the land is still in the family, mm -hmm. but there's a whole lot of dispute within mm -hmm. family members that are trying to pull it apart. Mm -hmm. But because we consider it as air property, it's so bogged down as to who owned the land. You know, one person dies, then another, and then that land goes to somebody else, their family members. So legally, it's bogged down, <laughs> which was an asset for us. But uh, in terms of the legality of it, it, it depends. It really depends on the state as well as the people in the family that you have to talk to about the land. Thank you. Hi, my name is Luann Wills Merrill. I'm the great-great-granddaughter of Verdell Wills, who was a homesteader in Mississippi. Um, I'm just crazy enough to drive from Chicago to Choctaw County, Mississippi, go to the courthouse, get kind of some weird looks, <laughs> and start going through the records, which it's amazing. Uh, it looked like nobody touched the records. It was dusty, so these came in handy. But um, in going through the records, I did discover that uh, all those acres of land are owned by a company. So then I start going through the deed records and the purchase records and the tax records. And what I told in, this, in the book was a happy story of all this money that my ancestors were paid for the land. But there's a piece I don't understand because of course that part of the books, it wasn't present when I got there. They said they haven't seen it in many years, but um, it's possible that my ancestors lost it for tax because as I went through the records, um, they had taken out a loan on the land, and so I'm not sure they may have gotten that payment in order to pay someone back that they had borrowed money from, because when I went through the records, somebody was buying up a bunch of land back then. Hello, my name is Angela Walton Raji, and in response to the question in terms of, well, what do you do next, you, you find this document. As a genealogist, I'll ask the question to you, what do you do when you find anything beyond that happy dance? What do you do? <laughs> you incorporate that story into your family narrative, mm -hmm. 
you've got to tell the story. You just don't find a census record and then, oh, there they are, and then put it away and never look at it again. The same way with the land patent, the same way with the land entry papers that you're going to find. You tell the story. When Bernice showed the document of my ancestor mentioning he was going away to school, it's not on the land patent where he went to school. I had to go find that out. I had to ask questions. Where, wait a minute, this is 1892. What do you mean you were going away from southwest Arkansas, a little town called Horatio, Arkansas? Going where? So I had to then look and see, well, what schools would have been available to him? Now, I grew up in western Arkansas, and I thought, well, there's the school in Pine Bluff. And when I grew up, it was Arkansas AM and N. It's now University of Arkansas Pine Bluff. But I had to do some research on the history. That's when I found Branch Normal College. That's when I went on the Library of Congress site and found a yearbook with his name. So what do you do? You tell that story. Because I found out something none of us ever knew. I thought my father and some of his first cousins who were descended from my grandmother's siblings, I thought those were the first generation of college educated people. Nope. There was Uncle Irving in 1892 getting a college education. The family wasn't even 30 years out of slavery. And here was the first college educated man in the family. You tell that story. Also, one other recommendation, there's a wonderful website, acrevalue.com, A-C-R-E value.com. Go on that site. Zoom in on your ancestors' land. Just keep zooming in, zooming in. You'll see eventually your ancestor's name is going to appear on that map. Find out what's there now. I found out there's several large poultry houses. I don't know if that's Tyson's Chicken or whoever it is or KFC or somebody, but now there's a poultry farm on that ancestor's land, but not far away. There's land available for sale. Someone trying to move back to the country? buy a parcel of that land back, perhaps. It's time to do that. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, good afternoon. Um, my, my name is James Morgan. Um, I just had one question, which is, I want to know a little bit about the production of the book, and particularly, you know, you all were working on this uh, over during the pandemic and everything. What, what has that experience been like for you all working together and coordinating? And I uh, just wanted to hear a little bit about that. Okay. Thank you for your question. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming and thank you for the wonderful questions. My name is Fallon Goff. I am a descendant or a relative, rather, of a Florida homesteader. And that is a wonderful question. So I can attest to that firsthand. I did not know Bernice. This is my first time meeting her in person. So in terms of doing research and working on such um, an extensive project, without actually meeting someone, I can stand here and say it, we were quite successful. <laughs> Thanks to Bernice and her efforts in gathering us together, um, I started off by going on Facebook and you know, being in lockdown, everybody's on Facebook, everybody's on social media. Bernice had a post and like she said, do you have any descendants? And so I saw the, of the Homestead Act of 1862 and I saw this and I said, you know, I do not, but guess what? I'm going to see if I do, and if I don't, I'm gonna help somebody else. So my initial goal was not even to think I'd find someone, it was to say, hey, if she's willing to put this information out here over social media and look for people, then I'm willing to go give this to someone else. And that's, that's what you guys can do here today. You can find someone else to give it to. So during the lockdown, and back to your question, we were able to build this bridge over the internet. We were able to communicate and keep the lines open. I was able to reach out to her. We were able to reach more people. So I would say it was quite exciting and rewarding because not only did I, I make a new friend, a new mentor, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a contributor in a book and I also more importantly found a piece of my family history that we had never known about. We went to the land. And guess what? It's lockdown. So no one's out there. We were the only <laughs> ones there. We got to see this land. I got to gather this soil. So um, it was a rewarding experience. And thank you for such a, a thoughtful question. And James, I want to say that the history press believed in us because I submitted a proposal stating that I'd like to have a book published called The Black Homesteaders of the South. And they said, tell us more. 
And I told them more. I said, we have 49 stories and 31 contributors. And they said yes. And that's why we have this book. And yes, we did have a Zoom meeting. All of us got on Zoom. We talked about it. Because if they didn't want it, there would be no book. And the stories would, they would be on the, the website. But we decided it was time that we also put our story in a book so that the school children can know that they're black homesteaders. So that you don't get that response, there were no black homesteaders in the South. Yes, there were. And here's the proof. And these are the people that they stepped up. And they did it. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dolores Mercedes Franklin, and I did research in Ascension Parish. And there's another story of another relative that was done by one of my cousins in the book. I met descendants of my great-great-grandfather who was from Africa. From three of his children were reunited before, during slavery, we were separated to different plantations in Ascension Parish and Terrebonne, and now we're reunited. We're reunited. Kimberly lives in California. And one of the other cousins that I met, we went on a, uh, before I knew she was my cousin, we went on a road trip to look at the records of the conveyance of the plantation, and all the way up in the car, I said, woolly, 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 and all the way up in the car, she said, Sally, 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 Sally. <laughs> so we got there, and we got the records. And in the margin, which you won't see if you get copies of it, you have to have the original document in front of you. In the margin, it said that Sally was Willie's daughter. Oh. So suddenly, we were related. <laughs> and so I wrote about the Thompsons. I wrote about Sally's family. So that's what it brings about. Hi, my name is Katherine Perkins, and I want to thank you all for this wonderful opportunity to learn about the Homestead Act. Um, one of the reasons I say this is that my family is from um, Homer, Louisiana, in Claiborne oh. Parish, and we, owned, we still own land that my great-great-great-grandfather had. It was, you know, and we have been trying to find out how he got this land. I mean, it's been this huge question, and we've been trying to figure it out, and now that I know about this Homestead Act, I'm going to go on to the you know, land uh, uh, bureau of land um, management, management site and everything mm -hmm. else and try to figure out if I can find out if this is the way that he actually um, obtained this land. So thank you very much. My question is, you know, it is, you, you are all such fabulous detectives. <laughs> I, I am just in admiration of this. How much of the research um, is done online? How much was done at the archives, National Archives, and how much was actually done at you know the places where you know this land happened to be? Because as someone said up there, they drove down to Alabama, I think it was, right? I, I think so, um, to to the courthouse and showed up to look through the files there. I mean, like you know, do I have to drive down to Claiborne Parish to, to the courthouse there and to start looking at at things, or can I do it online? Can I do it here in D.C.? First of all, the response is all three. Okay. <laughs> um, yes, I, w I went to Livingston Parish. I went to the courthouse with my mother, requested every document that they had, and I was told, well, you know, uh, you're going to have to come back because you're going to need overalls because it's in the basement or somewhere. I looked at my mother. She looked at me, and we said, we'll wait. And we received all the documentation. That was at the courthouse. S information that I would never have found online. So there's a point in time where you're going to have to go there. And yes, you can't get your land entry case files unless you go to get them from the National Archives because all of the case files are not online. Some states are, you know, Utah, Nebraska, some of those states. But when we're talking about our southern states, we have to get them from the National Archives right now. And so this is just what we have to do. I'd like to mention the 
Oh, and the records cost $50. <laughs> Thank you. I just want to say when Ms. Bernice said we're going to come together and do this book and you can expand your story, I said, I got to go to Alabama. <laughs> so I didn't drive all the way to Alabama. That would have been, I couldn't do that. But I drove to, I flew to Atlanta and drove to Alabama, went to three different courthouses, spent uh, two days going through deed books to find out where, what happened to this land, and it was worth it. There's a lot you can get online these days, and actually I found out at the courthouse that Alabama deeds are online, um, so, but I wouldn't have found that out if I didn't go to the courthouse. So, you know, you gotta do everything you can. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I enjoyed your presentation, and I admire your curiosity and where it brought us. Um, my question is for one of the Florida homesteaders. I'd love to hear from Fallon. Um, my name is Megan, I study agriculture, and looking at Florida, it contains a lot of wetlands, so as far as like land management, I'm curious to know which part of Florida had the largest collection of homesteaders, is a two-part question. And the second question is, did you find any descendants that are still living in your, in your research? Thank oh, you. And thank you, Megan, and uh, thank you for your thoughtful question, and it's a great question. So while Margo and I, uh, I know for sure, were the Florida descendants who were doing some extra research, most of our um, results popped up between Central Florida all the way to Northern Florida. So while working in agriculture, that's my field as well. I work for the Department of Agriculture. Um, even nowadays, you'll see a lot of our crops bearing uh, produce that we sell across the United States are found in Central Florida and in Northern Florida. So we were able to find large groups of descendants of homesteaders, or these homesteaders rather, in these cities like Columbia County, Gadsden County, um, there were just Sewanee County. There were more descendants that you could ever imagine and some of them were related to each other, some of them were neighbors. We found out that sometimes um, it ended up being that it may have been a previous enslaver who signed off on the witnesses for the entire community. So uh, it was very interesting to see in Florida. And I'm sorry, what was your second question, Megan? Thank you, and yes, thank you for that question as well. Now this is very interesting. A lot of my uh, for counter genealogists and counterparts, they were able to know their families and know the land. That wasn't the case for me. Um, our family did not keep the land, and my grandmother was uh, the living descendant, but we didn't find any direct descendants from his line. My grandmother was his niece. So after doing a lot of research and um, a lot of I guess, spy work, we were able to find, I actually found Simon Bell's descendants living in Tampa. They had no idea that that was their great, great, great grandfather. Um, so it turns out that those are our cousins and we were able to reconnect with the side of the family that we didn't know exist. And the other, the homesteaders that I found, um, I ended up finding some of their descendants who were alive and well in the central Florida area as well, but they did, had no idea that their family owned this property. So it was a very good opportunity for me to give them these documents that they had never seen. So I would say out of, I found over 150 so far, and out of all of those, I've researched three family lines where I found the living descendants. So thank you for the question. My name is Dr. Nona Edwards, and I'd like to let everybody know I've been a family historian for the past 30 years. I found the Bureau of Land Management records 17 years ago related to my great-great-grandfather. My curiosity was not finding the land. I wanted to find who the former slave owner was. Through the research of the Bureau of Land Management in the homestead records, I found homesteads of at least six other people that are related to my family. During the course of the pandemic, my family has had a Zoom meeting for genealogy. I'd like to mention my two cousins, Eddie Brumfield, <laughs> Junior, <laughs> Cynthia, they were part of the Zoom meetings. It was through those Zoom meetings that I met Bernice, and we also found 
the great-great-granddaughter of our former slave owner. If you remember that picture, the, the, the white Caucasian people sitting down, one is Henry S. Brumfield. His great-great-granddaughter made that picture available. We would have never known what our great-great-grandmother was or what she looked like if it hadn't been for her. Lo and behold, it turns out she's a cousin. <laughs> well, that's another long story. <laughs> but I'd like to let you know that it's not just finding the land. It's getting the stories. You know you know when somebody was born, and you know what when they died. But we need to know the in-between. I just wanted to say um, in response to the Florida question, because I wrote a Florida story as well, and a lot of my family's from southern Alabama, but some of them crossed over the line into north Florida and got their homesteads there as well. And the story I wrote in the book is actually Sissy Houston's grandfather, um, so also the great-grandfather of Whitney Houston and Dionne Warwick. Um, yeah, so they, and their whole family had a lot of land as well. So. I wanted to share, uh, looking at the land for James Riley, uh, he received 165 acres of land in Mississippi. And none of his family, and he was my great, great uncle, knew about the land. And they said, what happened to the land? And that's a lot of questions, what happened to the land? I knew nothing about the land. So you're talking about going to the courthouse. I tracked that land. Unfortunately, due to the times of the economy, a lot of the land was sold off bit by bit. In Mississippi, it was lumber companies. You know, the lumber companies came in and purchased little bit by little bit and only left enough for the farmer to live on. So it was like I found this person who had the land, and then I looked around, and we're talking about uh -huh, 10 acres. And they said, what happened? So we have a story to tell, but we have the research to look back and say, we had hard times too. They fought hard to get the land. And unfortunately too, the migration of the North Many of our people wanted to go north and felt that they needed to sell off the land to go there. But now we are coming back to the south and we're looking at our history and said, why did we do that? But it was a time of survival and you do what you need to do during that time but that does not eliminate telling the story. So get back, look at the history and tell your story because it's there to tell and your children need to know those stories that we had land and our ancestors, although they may not have been able to read or write, but they managed to get it. And that, let's not let that go by the wayside, okay? I just want to say one thing. First of all, I want to thank Bernice for something that she has done. One of my favorite writers uh, from West Africa has encouraged many of her readers to move beyond the myth of the single story. And we all have more than one story in our lives. Our lives are very different as adults than they were when we were younger adults than they were when we were adolescents and, of course, as children. But one of the stories, the single story, that we often hear when it comes to African Americans in the South who are farmers, there's only one story we hear, sharecroppers. They worked all day and had to give nine-tenths of what they earned to the landowner. But, thank you Bernice, you have helped us move beyond the single story. Yes, sharecropping is a part of the African American story, but it's only one part. 
She has presented in her book 49 instances of individuals who were not a part of that narrative. They became landowners. And we do have that obligation to go beyond the myth of the single story. Because you cannot take a paintbrush and paint it all over black America. Everybody was a sharecropper. No. I have 49 instances in this book of people who were not. They were landowners. So thank you, Bernice. You've thank inspired you. me. Thank so thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so this will conclude the uh, Black Homesteaders of the South presentation and question and answer period. We will have a book signing outside, right? Yes, I won't make it Okay. Thank you. This was amazing. Please, another round of applause. I'm going to get you over this way, Bernice. And while we have the descendants here to get a little bit deeper onto the stage where our photographer can get um, some pictures of you all, you can just scoot on down there. And Leah Jones, our fabulous photographer on the, our Smith team, will definitely set you up. She's good for that. <laughs> she will definitely do that. And a few announcements. There will be a book signing after this program. You need something else? OK. There will be a book signing after this. If you have your books, that's great. There are only a few left. Uh, we've basically sold out. So if you need one, go ahead and get one um, now. And then she will be ready for you all when she's done with the photos. One more round of applause for those who are still here. Thank you so much for attendance. Continue the conversation about descendants and your family history. Take care. <laughs>